Christopher Warnock is a, in my opinion, a luminary in the world of astrology, magic, and hermetic mysticism. Uh, this this towering intellect is not only a man whose books that I've read in order to advance my knowledge of astrology. Uh, he's also trying to get Chris on the line right now, actually. Um, now, as I was saying, Christopher Warnock has actually filed no fewer than 16 petitions of A. Kertiorari with the United States Supreme Court. And he's a member in good standing with the bar of the Supreme Court of Iowa. So his credentials are impeccable. And uh, I tell you what, I'm very thrilled to have him here with us tonight. And as soon as he gets here, we are actually going to talk all about mysticism and spirituality in the Renaissance era and how it applies to the modern day. And I do believe Mr. Warnock is with us uh, now. Mr. Warnock, are you there? Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Oh, how nice. How nice. Well, thank you very much for joining us. We have so much to get into tonight, and I don't want to waste a single second. Well, I have a lot of people, they ask me, you know, what can traditional astrology do for me? You know, my problems are modern and complex. Uh, what would you say to somebody who asks you that question? Oh, we had, they had the same problems then as they do now. Everyone <laughs> wants to know about love. That's the biggest question I get, right? right. And then they yeah. ask about money. And then they have a variety of other, of other questions. But, you know, people just don't really change. You know, we've got the same problems then as now. And sure. so, um, you know, someone might be asking about, actually, I'm not very good at lost items. I was going to say, well, they lost their car keys. But um, I, don't do, I don't like to do lost item worries. I'm not very good at those. But love questions, hey, I get a lot of those questions. And just like Lily, William Lily, who's a very famous horror astrologer, we have some lists of, we have his workbooks. And there's page after page of love questions, and that's exactly what I get. So, you know, typically what, you know, again, today, um, you know, I had people asking me about, about love. And they say, you know, very typically they've got someone they're interested in. What's going to happen with this relationship? And so what I do is uh, traditional astrology is very focused on practical, um, you know, uh, concrete results. So what I, the technique I love is called horary astrology, where you look at the time of the asking of the chart, or actually when I receive and understand it, but it's the time of the chart rather than a birth chart, and then that gives us the answer. So if someone comes to me and says, you know, Chris, uh, you know, I've, got, I've just met this wonderful person. Will I marry them or will I have a, a, a committed relationship with them? I take it, I look at the heavens at that moment, and then I can judge the results from that. And so that's that's real useful. That's real useful information. You can I can I can predict the future, not for everything in all respects, but if you can ask a yes or no question, right, that has concrete results, then I can give the answer to that question pretty accurately. So I think that's pretty useful. And so um, you know, I really think you know we 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 tend to think oh we've got TVs and we've got you know we've got internet and everything, but in fact this is a methodology that's been proven you know, over uh, basically about a thousand years of, of practice. And so that's one of the reasons that it's so accurate and so precise. So that's a bit of, bit of I'm going to give you a lot of long answers. Give me a short <laughs> question. Well, that's fine. That's, that's what you're that here for. I'm cer certainly hoping to hear him. And I got to say, uh, you, I've, uh, Hor uh, Warnock's Horary Casebook is a, a foundational text for for my efforts to understand Horary, uh, you can definitely find that at renaissanceastrology.com along with a variety of Mr. Warnock's other writings. Uh, now, I'd actually, one question I, I'm curious, the, the, the traditional astrologers, they had a much different science than we did, and, and you're a modern intellectual. How did you deal with the fact that they, for instance, thought that the sun revolved around the earth and, and, and things that we now know are false? Oh, well, I'm not a modern intellectual anymore. <laughs> okay. I'm traditional. I mean, here's the thing, okay? You know, one of the things, one of the things I really emphasize with my students, and in fact, I, we start all my full courses out. If you want to study with me, you know, as a full student, the first thing we start out with is something called worldview. And worldview is, it's not just our philosophy about the world, it's our unconscious assumptions it's our whole conditioning and, and our, what we've been brought up to believe and, and, and how we've been taught to see the world. And so there's a tendency to say, well, reality is reality. 
but we all have a very specific view of reality that's very much coming from our culture and what we've been trained to see. And so the modern worldview is based ultimately on a view that nothing exists except matter and energy. And usually when people say spirituality, what they mean is a fancy kind of psychology. And what psychology is, is from your mind, and what's your mind? It's your brain thinking. It, it must be, because obviously right. nothing exists except matter and energy. And if people think about spiritual things as some kind of energy, it's like magnetism or something, and that's, it sort of gets in a loop with that. Traditional, now before, what they call, call I always say the quote enlightenment, before about 1700, and in fact in every traditional society in the world, so our society is alone really in thinking that, they saw the spiritual as something that really existed. Now, not physically, it doesn't physically exist, but, right. you know, and let me just give you an example, a way to kind of wrap your head around it. Okay. Essentially, we've got, you know, there's no other physical place other than where we are right now. You know, the, the universe, that's all there is physically. But if we think about that, there's more to it than just matter and energy. And, I, and, and the example I'm going to give you is if you think about a savanna, you know, I could say in Africa, before right. there's even any life on it, you've got a certain amount of water, a certain amount of light, a certain amount of nutrients. That can support, let's say, a million pounds of vegetation. Okay? And we know that because we know how much light there is, we know how much water there is, how much sunlight there is. And that's the carrying capacity of that land. And then with that million pounds of vegetation, that can support 100,000 pounds of herbivore. And so you can, you can have antelopes or whatever. Before there's even anything there, we know there's only going to be that many, you know, that many uh, you know, herbivores. Then you've got 1,000 pounds of carnivore. So all these complex ecological niches, all these complex interactions are built in there before there's even anything happening. And that's a good way to think about the spiritual because it's the underlying relationships that are built in to, to, the, to the cosmos. And so, you know, that, getting your kind of head around that, it takes a long time. It took me about 10 years to kind of step out of the modern way of thinking and step into the traditional way of thinking. And so by worldviews, you can almost put on or put off like a hat, you know. Mm -hmm. And so you put that traditional worldview on where magic is possible, where the spiritual exists, and all of a sudden you can do magic and you can work with the spiritual realm. And so if you think like a modern person, right, you're going to have trouble. Mm -hmm. Now, the sun going around the earth. Okay, that's an interesting one. So, you know, that's true if you go out into space. That's exactly what you're going to observe. From the, from the standpoint of earth, though, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. And, I mean, if you, if you try to r run your life in such a way that the sun doesn't rise in the east and set in the west, that's kind of a messed up life. You're, not, you're going to be getting up in the middle of the night. You know, <laughs> right. that's reality from this particular standpoint, okay? And if you think about celestial navigation, like if you were out in a ship before we had, you know, um, uh, you know um, tracking and everything like that, before we have all the satellites, um, then you would have used uh, a ge what's called geocentric astronomy, which, again, the Earth is stand still for that, and the sun rises and east sets in the west, and everything revolves around it. It's perfectly accurate, again, for surveying. And so it's a matter of perspective, you know. And the Earth going around the sun, actually sometimes, you know, people, people there were, those theories are out there. The other one that I, I hear a lot is, oh, they just thought the world was flat. Nobody from about 400 B.C. who was educated <laughs> to the present ever thought the world was flat. That's a myth that's been invented. We like to think we're really advanced. And we right. do have some technology, but certainly in a spiritual way, we're way, way far behind, you know, our, our ancestors. They, had, they were far more advanced than we were spiritually in their knowledge. And so the thing is, it, it is, is that, you know, the type of astronomy that I use, and, you know, if you go to astronomers, they'll, they'll, they grind their teeth, but they'll admit, yes, it's perfectly accurate in terms of if you look up in the sky, that's what you'd see. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're working at. We're, it's, it's just, you know, the, the heliocentric, the, you know, the, the sun moving around the Earth. I mean, again, even NASA, when they sent a sat, you know, when they send satellites to Mars or whatever, they're using geocentric astronomy because it works for that, for that methodology. And none of these is absolute truth. Again, it depends on what your perspective, what you're going for. And so since we're looking at cycles and the heavens give us a very regular cycle, it works. Now, you could do a heliocentric astronomy. I mean, there are people that do that. It's relatively new. The nice thing about the astrology, that, astronomy that we use is it's, like I said, a thousand years old. We've had a lot of time to work with it. 
And so I guess the final thing I'd say about that is if it's like saying, look, I went to the movies and I saw this newsreel and someone says, oh, no, that's all fake. Because, you know, in fact, when you see a movie, it's just still pictures. So that was all an illusion. You know, it doesn't really, it's not really the truth. And you say, well, that's true, but that doesn't mean that the news that I saw on that isn't correct. You're, you're correct that, yeah, that's how it works. But that's what I saw. It looks like a movie. It, it gives me perfectly accurate information for my purposes. So that's what I'd say about the, the style of, of, of the astronomy. And so a lot of that is people want to believe that this, is, that this doesn't work. And they're looking for excuses for it. Because ultimately, like I said, let's get back to worldview. Astrology is a spiritual science. It doesn't work through sunspots or magnetism or anything like that. It works through the underlying spiritual relationship of all things. And so if there's no spiritual realm, if there's no spiritual uh, reality, then obviously it can't work. And everything else is just kind of double talk. And I hear a lot of double talk arguments against astrology. The real argument that people should be making is, look, there's no, there's no spiritual anything. But that's a little bit of a problem because that means there's no God, you know, and that wipes everything else out. So a few, you know, atheists are willing to make that argument. And that's why they get so upset because everyone pretty much operates off those unconscious assumptions. And yet they turn around and say, well, you know, obviously it's, just, it's funny how people are a little schizophrenic about it. So they'll assume that, yeah, it's matter and energy unconsciously, and then they'll say, oh, I'm a spiritual person, I believe in God. And it's kind of contradictory. So that's like one of the reasons I like traditional astrology is based on traditional philosophy. And traditional philosophy, there wasn't an argument between the scientists and the theologians. Before 1700, everybody got along because the Western scheme of knowledge included the spiritual. They threw it out about 1700. And so, you know, again, it's, com it's, it's complicated. It's hard to wrap your head around it, but that's because there's been a real revolution in how people see the world. And that doesn't mean we're, we're better now. I mean, some ways we've got high tech, we get internet and everything, but like I said, in other ways we've actually fallen behind spiritually. So that's one of the things I've been interested in doing is going back and saying, okay, what did, the, what did our ancestors know uh, that we don't, and let's bring that back into popularity. So that's one of the things I've been doing, trying to do with traditional astrology and astrological magic is to try to revive it and to, we have a, we tend to think of wisdom from the East, but we have a lot of wisdom in our own tradition in the West. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just um, been lost. And so what we're doing is a lot of people are involved in this now in the past 20, 30, 40 years to help revive that lost knowledge. Well, another long answer to a short question. <laughs> well, well I, it's very it's interesting up. that you brought that up because a lot of the modern astrology, psychological astrology, it lacks, it has no remedial ability. In other words, it has no access to remedies, no pres nothing to prescribe, but, but it seems to me that the sort of astrology that you practice, the more traditional or ancient type of astrology, it does have uh, a, a prescriptions that you can make, remedial measures that you can actually make based off the chart to get some relief for whatever's ailing the person. Well, yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, there's certainly the... Um you know, as you were saying that, you know, it's interesting because I have a lot of respect for modern astrology as a method. If you look at someone's birth chart and you consider that as a map of their psyche, of their psychology, it's quite, it's quite accurate. In fact, that's one of my favorite things to do in the natal chart. I have almost a, uh, a modern approach in some ways to, to, to na not 100%, but I do a lot. I like to do psychological astrology. And, you know, really, knowledge, particularly self-knowledge, is the ultimate remedy. Okay, because if you don't know yourself, if you don't know who you are, and you don't know what your desires and your emotions and your drives are, you're really not going to be able to do anything. And ultimately, the solution, the real solution to your problem starts with that self-knowledge. Because if you say, you know, I am lacking something and I've got to go out and get it. If I only could be rich, then I'd be happy. You know, you look at rich people. They, they say, I think it's, I don't know, there's different numbers, 50,000, 70,000, and above that, they're not happier. So there, and so that's, we can take, that's a sort of a spiritual approach. So that's ultimately what I would say is that if you're running and running and running and running and you're dissatisfied with your life as it is, um, and you're convinced that if you just got more stuff or things or a person, you know, a soulmate or something, that you would be happy, ultimately you're going to find you're not happy. Now, that being said... You know, it certainly is helpful to have money. It certainly is great to have a relationship. I'm happily married, which I can say. And so, yes, you can get these tangible benefits. Now, 
you know, in some ways, though, if you want to make a lot of money, you should become a stockbroker. To use a spiritual means to get a material end is not always the most efficient way to do it. And again, though, I'll say, here I am. I'm a professional astrologer. I mean, even though I'm in the bar, even though I'm a lawyer, I don't really make much money doing it. That's my hobby. I say that's my hobby. Mm. I do it for fun, you know, to help people. But the astrology has come through, I think, at least a significant amount from the amount of the astrological magic that I've been doing. And so for me, it's a spiritual practice, but I do believe that a lot of these benefits have, have flown through it. So let's just talk about that. So, okay, so if you were to say, okay, I'm interested in love, you know, you could say, okay, well, let's, what, what astrological factor, what planet is appropriate for love? Well, you know, Venus really is the planet of love. So what we would do then is take a look at your chart, and we could say, well, you know, Venus is afflicted. Now, again, in traditional astrology, we can look at where the planets are placed in the zodiac as they move orbit around the Earth, and we can f and see whether they're everywhere from being very, very strong to very, very afflicted and everything in between. And so we can get a very pr precise take on that. So we can look at Venus and see so can say, well, you know, Venus is a little weak in your chart, so a Venus talisman might be a good thing to help you as far as love. And so a Venus talisman, what we would do to make a Venus talisman, now we typically will look out, right now, for example, I'm looking out for the rest of 2014 into 2015 to find good dates to make talismans. And so, you know, it might only be, uh, you know, typically the, the, the time span for making a talisman is something from between half an hour to an hour, and it might not reoccur for a whole year. We have talismans we can never make again because the timing will never recur again. So we have to get all sorts of different factors that we line up, and we want to find the time that is strongest for Venus. For example, when Venus is in her sign, uh, Taurus, or sign Libra, when she's exalted in Pisces, when she's rising on the horizon or directly overhead, Venus hour, there's a lot of factors we look at. And that's taken me, you know, again, I've been doing this for 15 years. It's complicated. And so then at that time, we want to make the talisman and invoke the spirit of Venus. And so we... we in a sense, charge it with that Venus energy. Then if you get that talisman, then that's got the Venus energy or the Venus spirit, and that can help you. Now, tip, okay, what kind of effects did you get from a Venus talisman? It really varies. People say, what's going to happen, Chris? I say, look, I don't know. It really varies for each person. I've had people that got an effect from a talisman before they even received it. They ordered it and haven't even got it yet. I had people that got it the day they got it. I've had people that have said, oh, it took a couple months. And I've certainly had people that have said they got no effects at all. Those are typically the people that have too high expectations. They were expecting something like Harry Potter, or they were expecting to win the lottery the next day. Right. And that's not, that's not going to happen. People say lottery to me. I say don't buy a talisman because that's mm. you know you can increase your odds a hundred a hundred times. You're still not going to win the lottery, you know. And that's that's not that's not realistic. But uh, say a Venus talisman, a love talisman, typical effects. People that you are interested in, like an ex girlfriend or boyfriend, if you haven't talked to for a while, all of a sudden start calling you up. You get these con you sort of like ringing the psychic uh, bell. Um, when you go out and you socialize, you feel more comfortable, you feel more social. People you're interested in or more attracted to, they interact with you. Now, a couple times I have had this. People have gone back to me and said, hey, you know, this is maybe two or three times in 10 years, said, hey, I bought that talisman and I, I got married or I had a committed relationship. So that's. That's so, again, it's not like, again, I couldn't guarantee, oh, yeah, you're definitely going to have a relationship. Now, the other thing is you've got to take practical efforts. If you got a Venus talisman and you stayed in your apartment all day long and you didn't go out, someone's not going to chew up on your doorstep, you know? You get a wealth yeah. talisman and you make no effort, whatever, to, to, you know, for example, have a small business or, you know, try to make money in a practical way. You need a way for that to manifest. I mean, the spiritual manifest through material effects. You're not going to have bags of gold materializing out of nowhere. And it's not like, this is real. It really works. But that means it's not like the movies, you know? And right. so, because if it did, I mean, the lottery, think about that. I, people ask me about lottery talismans. I'm like, yeah, if I could make a lottery talisman, I'd make one talisman, make it for myself, and then I would retire. Why would I want to sell you a lottery talisman? <laughs> right? That makes it's like sense. Stock market. You have a stock market. You pick stock market. I mean, I'm no good at picking stock market. And I see these systems i'm like if it really worked why would they sell it right you know just sure. but people want to believe and it's really easy to tell people stuff like that and then, again with talismans i have to be careful because people call me up and they say oh i don't have any money to pay the rent I, I i'm in desperate shape i need a talisman i say don't buy a talisman i've refused to sell people talismans in that sort of circumstance because that's not realistic 
You know, you need to be able to put the time and energy and effort into it. You need a way for it to manifest. And it does, you can do some amazing stuff with talismans. Um, so that's been very exciting for me because that's an area that I basically have revived single-handedly. Um, nobody else was practicing traditional astrological magic. And, you know, I've really been privileged to be, to be involved with it. And we've done some translations, and I've got the website, and we've done a tremendous number of... of I have a friend who's a, 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 my jeweler who's also a, a magician, uh, a mage. And so we work together um, to make the talismans. I pick the times that he actually does the, the casting. He's in Boulder, Colorado. And so that's been very exciting. And we actually have two talismans that are now in the permanent collection of the British Museum. The British Museum in London has mm -hmm. one of the most amazing collections of magical artifacts. <laughs> and so he was talking to a curator doing some research, and they got very interested in our talismans and actually asked us if we would donate some, and we did. And so now you, if you look at our website, you can see that we have uh, two talismans that were made. Uh, they're actually planetary, what are called planetary table talismans that, that he cast, and I picked the time for that are now in the, the British Museum's collection. So I was, I'm quite proud of that as, you know, showing that we really have the highest level of authenticity, you know, uh, and, and, and really effort that we put into uh, to making our talismans. Not only is it, is, not only do you display the highest level of authenticity, but also the highest level of scholarship uh, as well. I should point out that uh, you yourself, along with John Michael Greer, uh, pretty much uh, presented a long-lost magical grimoire, if I'm not mistaken, to the world, the Picatrix. Uh, and this was a, a, a feat of, of scholarship. This is a, a magical text, a text on magic. And I just want to let, let everyone know that what we're talking about here is electional astrology, choosing the right time for things, if I'm not mistaken. Right, Mr. Warnock? Yeah, w w basically what happened was I first, I actually studied horary um, with a teacher. And um, horary astrology, again, you look at a chart and you can read what's going to happen from the chart, the time in right. question. Electional is kind of the flip side of that, the mirror of it. Because if you look, if you pick a time, for, for example, if you pick a time that's a yes, right, you go yes right. answer, then that would be a good time to actually do it. You know, if, you, if someone came to you and said, well, I marry this person, and the chart said, yes, you would. There's lots of positive indications. Well, then that timing would be a good time to pick to choose to get married. And so I was able to learn electional astrology on my own. And then in order to do the talismans, again, you must use electional astrology. That's choice, like a, a, a political election. We use the word nowadays. It means a, a choice in politics. And that's uh, what we do use for astrological magic. You add in, though, the magic. It's a funny combination because astrologers are a little nervous about magic. And magicians are funny because they don't want to be weighed around for a particular time. They just want to do it whenever they want. So it's a, by doing astrological magic, you do this kind of a crossover. It's a hybrid. And you have to be willing to exert your will and be willing to do magic, but you have to wait till the appropriate time. And so it's an interesting combination. of It's very hermetic. You know, Hermes Trismegistus, the Herm the great great Hermes, he loves contradictions. He loves paradoxes. And so that's one of the things I'm really quite taken with. I always have loved paradox and loved, um, you know, mysteries like that. But yeah, the Picatrix was interesting. I was introduced to it by my teacher, um, uh, Robert Zoller, and it was only in Latin. And uh, I said, well, where's the translation? He said, oh, well, you know, don't worry about that. So 12 years later, um, you know, it took me 12 years to get it translated. And, and the Latin, I know, I don't know a lot of Latin, but the Latin I can use now, I can read sort of Latin text with magic. Um, you know, I learned from working with Picatrix. So John Michael Greer is quite the accomplished magician. He's the head of the ancient order of Druids in America. He's the Arch Druid. But he's quite an, uh, a well-known esoteric author and quite a good Latinist. And so he translated about 75 or 80 percent of it. But what I really focused on was the astrological portions. And that was, that was the key because it's highly technical. And so you have to understand astrological magic and uh, traditional astrology in order to be able to do it. So again, that was quite... You know, and it's interesting. It's really interesting. Today, um, it's on Amazon, and they have this weird pricing algorithm that jumps all over the place. They discount it. So right now, it's it's almost like it's set up for this this interview. It's forty eight percent off at oh, wow. at Amazon. I know it's incredible. They're losing money, and so instead of I think normally it's about thirty two dollars right today. You know, today right at the moment it's twenty dollars for a copy of Picatrix on Amazon. So you can just 
if you're interested, scoot over to Amazon and, and you can search Picatrix or my name, Christopher Warnock, W-A-R-N-O-C-K, and you can come up with that. But it's an amazing deal. I mean, it's almost 50% off, which is I would quite unusual. And it shot would, us up to like, today I was like 7,000th on this Amazon sales ranking. So that was like the highest, I've, I don't think I've ever been that high on Amazon. It usually bounces around about 50,000 or so, which is still pretty good. Um, I think we probably sell 30 or 40 copies a month, which is pretty amazing for a thousand-year-old astrological grimoire. But um, it's actually <laughs> right. fairly well known in the in the magical community, and, and people do um, like to buy copies. Now, the thing we're working on right now is I have another student of mine named Eric Perdue, and he's doing a modern translation of Agrippa's Three Books of Occult Philosophy. And that is available in a 17th century English translation, but it's kind of hard to read because the English is a little odd. And there yeah. were some mistakes made in the translation. And so hopefully he's going to come out with that. I'm really looking forward to seeing that because that's a really, really important magical text too. And what's happening is, again, in the past 20, 30 years, all of the secret knowledge has kind of come forth. You know, things that have been hidden for a long time have come forth. And so all of a sudden we're having this available to us in English translation. Uh, we can read it. We can work with it. And it's a really exciting time to be working with astrology, magic, and in fact, any kind of esoteric, um, you know, thing is just exploding, um, you know, and, and with Internet in particular. I mean, people are interested and open, and then it's easily accessible through Internet. So it's a wonderful time to be interested in, you know, astrology, magic, and any and sort of spiritual esoteric uh, uh, thing. Oh, uh, yeah. It's almost like a modern renaissance, a modern it golden is. age. It is. Well, every I, so since after, I have you here, I would be. I've been wanting to ask you this myself. You you've written a book about the lunar mansions, and I know using the lunar mansions that's important in your work. They remind, and please correct me if I'm wrong. They remind me an awful lot of the nakshatra system that the Vedists use. Well, it is Am exactly I, the same. I mean, the difference is this: is that the moon takes twenty seven point five days to orbit the Earth. So what the mansions are are, you know, the sun orbits the, the sun, or, you know, orbits the earth, or the earth orbits the sun, however you want to say it. From our standpoint, the, the sun's going around us. It takes a year, okay? The orbit of the okay. sun around the earth is a year. So the sun moves through the zodiac. So what the mansions are is a lunar zodiac, but instead of taking a year, it takes about a month. Mm -hmm. That's where the month comes from. It's the orbit of the moon around the earth. And so in the Vedic system, there's 27 nakshatras, which makes sense because it's 27.5 days. And in the Arabic system that we use in the West, there's 28, which again makes sense because it's 27 and change. And so I think part of the reason the Arabs liked the 28 is because there's 28 letters of the Arabic alphabet. And so they associate each letter of the alphabet with a mansion. And they used, did a lot of the, the Arab uh, magicians were famous for doing all sorts of Arabic, you know, language magic. They did all sorts of talismans with Arabic written on it or, you know, the name of Allah and things like that. And... Um, you know that that's quite. I, I don't read Arabic, unfortunately, um, but you know that's that's something that's kind of exciting. And um, so the mansions are really interesting. Um, you know, each I actually uh, there's a couple mansions that every month when the moon goes in. The, for example, the third mansion, the seventh mansion, both of those are for all good things. And so every month when the moon goes into the third mansion, I do. Uh, a invocation of the, the spirits of the third mansion, and the same thing with the seventh mansion. And it's interesting, I've had situations where the biggest day of business I had all month was, you know, right around like the day of or day after, or the, you know, uh, doing the, the third mansion ritual or the seventh mansion. And uh, I continuously have been doing these, these rituals once a month, you know, for years now. And again, that builds up a very close connection with the spirits of those, um, those mansions. And it increases, you know, the effect. And it certainly, like I said, has brought a real, you know, I've done, I've done, I'm doing well. <laughs> you know, I, like I said, I'm, I'm an astrologer, and yet I managed to, to have a nice little middle class existence. So, um, you know, it's, it's, I certainly, that's a testament to, you know, I think the, the power of, of astrological magic. But uh, mansions are mostly used for talismans. I mean, they're not really used in natal astrology. They're not used for predictive purposes. They're mostly used for, for talismans, for magical purposes. And, um, you know, um, like, for example, for the third and seventh mansion, those are both mansions of wealth or for things. You like to have the moon waxing because you know, it's for increase. And so that's, and then you would also maybe want to have the moon rising or directly overhead, which is culminating, and then not afflicted. And 
so that's kind of how you would go about choosing a you know a good time to make a lunar mansion talisman. Um, and each of them has an image uh, prescribed for it. Um, for example, the third mansion is interesting. It's a, a woman with it's almost like a yoga pose with her right hand raised over her head. Um, the seventh mansion I like very much is a man um, praying, and um, so. And they also have different kinds of incense that you're supposed to... Now, I, I actually am now... I, I have a very heavy Zen Buddhist practice, so I, have, I use this sort of Japanese stick incense for everything. Um, and I use, end up using white candles for my ritual because I, ha I buy candles by the case. In fact, the other day I had seven candles going. I had seven different rituals going on, and so I, I tend to use white candles for that. The most important thing that I sort of emphasize with the ritual is um, be positive. You know, you, I only do positive... Uh, magic. And I only want to deal with angelic spirits, and so um, I use incense and use candles just as a sort of form of, of respect, um, and that's very traditional. Even in Zen, it's interesting. In the Zen ritual, they do the same thing. They'll, you know, for example, when you get presented with, a, like, if you become a priest, they give you your robes. They take the robes and they move them back and forth over the incense, just like we would do with a talisman. It's just amazing how these commonalities throughout all the spiritual practice. Um, you know, and that, that's something that we have, again, like I was talking about, we lost. I mean, we had this traditional view of reality. We had to open to the spiritual. The spiritual is moving through our lives in many ways. And now we've lost that. And so that's one of the things that's, that's really kind of exciting about astrological magic and talismans is, yes, you can get stuff for yourself, and yes, you can get, you know, um, material benefits, but ultimately it can be a spiritual path that opens us up to this bigger reality. Um, that includes the spiritual, and I think that's again one of the more exciting things about it, and it certainly has become a spiritual practice for me uh, as well. Yeah, I was surprised at the richness of the spiritual dimension of this very practical astrology. I tell you what, we got to take a commercial right now, Mr. Warnock, but when we get back, I'd like to talk to you about what sorts of spirits are ruling over these times. We'll be right back in one moment. A new era in psychic services has begun. PsychicAccess.com You can connect with our psychic advisors by telephone or chat 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. All of our psychic advisors are interviewed, fully verified and accuracy tested, assuring you quality service. We're living in some very troubled times right now. More and more, the world's problems are affecting us on a personal level. You don't have to deal with this alone. Our highly accurate psychics, caring advisors and talented mediums can help with situations you are currently experiencing and can let you know what the future may hold for you. All new customers get a free six minute reading. All you have to do is register. Why not visit us now and get a free reading at PsychicAccess.com. And welcome back to Psychic Viewpoint. I am here with Christopher Wardnock and just wanted to remind you that you can find him at renaissanceastrology.com where you can find software, CDs, books, courses, a whole lot more. Um, Chris, uh, welcome back. We were just uh, hey, glad about back. to talk. I would like to ask you a few questions uh, sure. about about some, some of that spiritual astrology. It seems like I read somewhere Robert Zoller mentioned a spirit of the times and I was wondering if I've always been curious about the spirit of the times and I was wondering if we were operating under any particular spirit in our modern times. I wanted to see what you thought about that. Um, I've, Robert in his course has a very interesting, in fact, I, want, I think it's a spiritual astrology chapter. He has a very interesting discussion of that. And that, you know, the German for that is Zeitgeist, you know, which is kind of uses as a yeah. metaphor. Um, you know, the example he uses is you know, like 1960, the 60s, and which which actually didn't really get going until like 1965, you know, and then if you look at 1968, I mean, there's a revolution in everywhere. You know, you think of like 68, um, like there's in, in Paris, there was a huge revolt. You know, there was a the there was a, a problems in Mexico City. They had this massacre of students. You have the Prague in 1968, Prague Spring in 1968. You know. The, the, you know, the protests that's going on in the United States, I mean, absolutely incredible. And, you know, there really did, all of a sudden, it seemed like, wow, this could change. And that, you know, that has been pervasive. I mean, if you look at me, I've still got, I kind of get this hippie thing. I'm still kind of doing that to a certain extent. I mean, that was very pervasive. But, you know, by 1970, Altamont, it was over, you know. 
and people yeah. could tell that. So I guess for me right now, I don't have access. Now, sometimes people will do these rituals and they'll say, oh, I talked to the spirit, and you know, I saw them and all that. And, you know, that's even taken somehow as like a test. If you don't have physical manifestation, it's not real. That's a kind of an odd test for a spiritual thing to act to insist it to be material. Um, you know, the spirits I'm dealing with are basically the angels and archangels of the planets and the celestial you know, the, the, like, stars and things like that that I'm dealing with. And even then, I'm not having conversations with them. I don't have that kind of direct communication. So I do not have access to, like, for example, in the Bible, it talks about each country having an archangel. For example, when Moses, remember, was cursing the Egyptians and said all the different, like, the rain of frogs and everything, they yeah. had to get the archangel of Egypt to sort of back off and stop protecting Egypt. You know, and I feel like the Archangel of America. There's like an Archangel and a demon. The Archangel of America looks like the Statue of Liberty. You know, give me yeah. your tire, your puddled masses. The demon of America looks like it's sort of like a, a an eagle-headed thing. You know, with like armor all over it and like claws and blood in the claws and stuff. I mean, because there's a dark <laughs> side to America. You know, yeah. there's an imperial side to America as well as there's a really positive side to it too. And that's true of all countries. They all have like a a light side and a shadow side, but I don't. I'm not in touch with them directly. Um, I mean, I know that there the world is a battleground between good and evil, you know, and that people they think they're acting in their own interest, and in fact they're at, they're they're pawns in a way in the struggle as well as maybe having their own stuff going on. But I don't have direct access to that. I mean, right now, you know, it's interesting. You know, we're living in a time when. Um, you know, the Cold War ended, and that sort of left a gap. I mean, who's the enemy? You know, is, is Putin, is Russia going to come back and be the enemy again? I mean, drugs are casting around for that. You know, terrorism, looking yeah. for an enemy. And we're living in a time where, you know, basically this idea that the economy was going to get better and better and better every year, and your kids were guaranteed to have a better life than you, that's over. You know, people now, if they're unemployed, they can be permanently unemployed. You know? And... If, you, if you're a tech person, if you're an internet person like me, I mean, I'm doing great because I don't have a job. You know, I'm not dependent on that. I, I can access the whole world. I've got these tech skills that I can use. So some people are doing well, but a lot of people, you know, it's tough. And um, at the same time, we're having this incredible spiritual upsurge, too. So, you know, global warming, I mean, I don't think you can deny that. Any, I mean, it's easy to put your head in the stand, I suppose, but the effects are, I mean, you can even in Iowa, we've been having this bizarre weather. It's, it's hotter. <laughs> the, the dreams of weather are crazy. So, you know, we're really living in, you know, it's, 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 it's obviously there's change. Exactly what it is, I don't know. I don't have access to that directly. I mean, I do think that's a good way of understanding. Like I said, there's a spirit, there's a quality of each moment. And, you know, like I said, the 60s are a great example. All of a sudden, you know, that spirit flipped, you know, from this yeah. totally conservative thing to this, you know, Jimi Hendrix and, you know, and Summer of Love and, you know, all this stuff. <laughs> wow. And that, and so where we are now, I have to go by external evidence, you know. But I, I right. do think that's a good way to understand reality. Now, evolution, I don't know. That's one of the ways we, that modern people like to organize reality, you know. And evolution was not a traditional... I mean, the Chinese, they had kind of a, you know, what would happen was that you got this... Um, you'd have chaos, and then a, a leader would arise, and he'd found a new dynasty, right? And then right. they'd be efficient, and then it would sort of fall apart and get corrupt, and then we have chaos again, and it would start over again. So their view of reality was sort of cyclical. Whereas, you know, the West, even though we say we're, we're, we're secular... We've got this sort of Christian view of reality built in, and there's a, there's a beginning and an end. There's a, there's a creation, and there's a day of judgment. And so even though we're all Western and atheistic or whatever, we still have this sort of tendency to think in terms of, well, okay, there's a beginning and an apocalypse, like that whole 2012 thing. Boy, there was yeah. a lot of publicity about that Mayan thing, and everyone was all excited about it, and of course nothing happened at that <laughs> level. You know? And so everyone's going to have a day of judgment when you die. Yeah, you're going to be, you know, that's your day of judgment. But whether society is going to totally, you know, an apocalypse, probably not, you know. And so, um, but that's what, you know, we have these views of reality. That's how we structure things. And so whether it's evolution or not, yes and no. I mean, I, I don't necessarily see that as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, 
always in, in play. I mean, evolution in terms of species, sure, that's going on, right? But whether yeah. it's, you know, it's, it seems very like it's a scientific version of the, of the Day of Judgment kind of thing. You know, the way people tend to think, okay, everything's getting better. Is it getting better? I don't know. You know, I think that's part of one of the problems that we're running up against. Is like the economy's not going to be able to grow to, so everybody can be rich, you know? That, you know, we don't have that. We had a, a brief kind of, in the America, this empty continent, all these resources, we w- used them up, and now what? You know, if everyone in China wants, and India wants a car, it's going to be a problem. You know, if everyone, had a, if everyone wants to have a U.S. standard of living, you know, 5% of the population in the U.S. uses 25% of the resources of the world. And that obviously can't continue, you know. And um, so, like I said, we're living in interesting times, but at times it's always it's always the best of times and the worst of times. So <laughs> I guess I kind of dodged that question. I, I guess the short <laughs> answer to that would be I don't know what the spirit is right now, you know. Um, no. But that's a really interesting way of looking at reality. It's 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 hard it's hard to actually put a name on the dom- on the dominating force that controls the zeitgeist it's interesting to see how it changes you know we had one in world war ii a certain spirit of the times in the world war ii era and it sort of evolved into that 60s movement and some of the nice things that happened before then like the establishment of the state of israel and things like that so but i'd look at the 60s movement and the spirit ruling over that time and i'm saying wow the same person who was you know, smoking marijuana in a field at Woodstock is now this Capricornian creature sitting in in in, in uh, Capitol Hill, and with the stroke of a pen is you know sending drones someplace. You know, so I'm not sure how the spirit of the late '60s ultimately is going to play out. Uh, well, you know what happened run. was there's a lot of people that just go with the flow, you know, but that that you couldn't have had the 60s without there being a significant number of people that, you know, really believed in it and also stuck with it. Because it had a pretty strong impact on the culture. Um, and for good and for evil, you know. It's sort of like, um, it's interesting how, because I do Zen, and I'm in a very traditional lineage, how, how just people just have this instant knee-jerk negative reaction to any kind of ritual or any kind of formality, you know. And right. it's, sometimes it's appropriate. I'm mean, like, you're in court, you don't want the judge to be sitting in a T-shirt scratching his butt, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> right. one of, you know what I mean? It's a certain times and formalities appropriate. And because in court, it's like, let's pay attention. You know, you go in and you got the flags and you got the judge sitting up on the bench and you got the robes on, and it's like, it's like a wake-up call. I mean, that's the most useful thing about it. It's like, hey, this is serious. You know, this is no joke. You know, you'll pay attention. And that's, you know, you can get caught up in it and, you know, you can have empty ritual and stuff like that. But, you know, there's actually a, a purpose to it. And yet the 60s, that was kind of like, oh, throw all that stuff out, you know. <laughs> and, like, for example, when I was a kid, you, you called adults Mr. So-and-so, Mr. Brown or whatever. You know, you wouldn't call them by their first name. Right. And so the lack of, you know, that's good in a way because, you know, you all want to be equal. But I, one of the things I do as a lawyer is land lieutenant, and I was talking to some, this parent, and she's, like, talking about her kids, and they were running wild. They're running this apartment and, like, having, you know, smashing it up and all this stuff. And I'm like, I'm thinking, you know, I don't have kids, but I'm thinking if I did, I wouldn't let them do that. But I'm kind of a relic. You know, nowadays, <laughs> the really kids run wild, which is good in some ways. You don't get disciplined. You don't have people getting, you know, spanked and stuff like that. But then there's a loss. So that's the thing is that's where I come back to evolution. I'm like, something's lost and something's gained. It's not like everything's getting better and better and better. The further we go in the future, it gets better. And the more we went in the past, the worse it was, you know. But that's how we tend to structure things. And we tend to think, oh, we're so advanced. It's like, yeah, we got, I mean, most people, I mean, I can't, I mean, computers, I can barely handle, like, switching to Windows 7, you know. But, like, (laughs) I don't understand how to make a computer, you know. So how much how much credit do I really get for that, you know? And so we think we're really advanced technologically, which you know we are. We're not. I mean, if you, it's funny. Like a car is basically the biggest technological change in cars was you know the um, automatic transmission. Now nowadays you do have a lot of electronics. They are heavily you know it's amazing those cars are used with so much like a it's run by the computer. But you know technologically it's still basically that 1900s technology. You know, uh, air conditioning. They invented air conditioning around 1900. They had fax in the 20s. You know, <laughs> a lot of the stuff we see. If you look at a jet, again, essentially, other than now they're doing a lot of electronic controls, the technology is the same. You know, and so it's it's not 
you know, in a lot of ways, it's, we're not as advanced as we, we think we are. So, um, well, well, that's off that's, on a tangent. You ask me another <laughs> question. Let's get, let's, get well, riff again. let's get riffing again. Well, that's one thing I like about traditional astrology is that you mentioned earlier there was a split. You know, now people these days look to, towards the East, towards Buddhism and Hinduism to get what they think is spirituality. And they, we don't really realize that there's such a, a similarity between uh, Indian astrology and the medieval astrology. And what interests me is, for example, the contributions of the Arabs to the traditional as- astrology. Because when I think of Islam and Islamic science, I think of this really sort of conservative and even uptight sort of approach to things. But back in the day, back in the Middle Ages and before the Middle Ages, certainly in the you know 600 A.D. Around, right around that that range, the the Arabs uh, were quite spiritual and they were excellent astrologers. That's, I've always found that to be fascinating. Yeah, I mean, you know, what happened was that when the Roman Empire fell, um, you know the in the West, they continued on in Byzantium, you know, in, in modern-day Turkey. And then a lot of that knowledge of the Greeks and the Romans passed to this advanced Islamic civilization. And people don't realize that, that, you know, around 800, 900, that the Islamic civilization, which, you know, the caliphate controlled most of the, of the, the, the Middle East and, you know, in North Africa and even into Spain, was the most advanced uh, cultural you know, part of the of the of what now the Chinese were doing their thing too, but you know much more than that. You're in the Dark Ages basically in Europe, and so uh, about 12 or 1300, then particularly in Sicily and Spain, which had been under the Islamic domination and was reconquered by the Christians, um, they got these translation teams together and they started translating all this you know, this useful material. But what happened basically was that there is the astrology basically began in Babylonian Chaldea around say. Three four hundred BC, they had a very advanced, um, they had very astral based uh, religion, and so the priests would watch the planets and record the planets, and then they started eventually predicting from that and doing people's horoscopes from that. And that the Greeks learned about it, the Romans learned about it, and then they passed. They kept passing this on. But you need a high technology and a pretty advanced civilization to do the math. The math is very complicated, and it takes. A, I mean, I use a computer, but doing it by hand is a lot of work, and so. Um, but, you know, the Islam, you know, the modern conservative stuff is, is relatively, is only part of Islam. I mean, I had an experience with uh, Sufism, which is the mystic side of Islam, when I was in Washington, D.C., and, in fact, was initiated as what's called a Darvish, which is an initiate of a, a Persian or Iranian uh, 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 Sufi order called the Nimatullahi, which means the wealth of Allah. And so that very, you know, very open, very spiritual you know, not conservative, the way we think of the Saudi, that's a particular style, the Wahhabi fundamentalism or the Taliban is, is modern, basically. They're fundamentalists. They're the equivalent of a fundamentalist Christian. They're fundamentalist Muslims, and they, all, they represent a small part of, of, of the uh, Islamic heritage. And so, um, you know, certainly that was something that I found very interesting about it. Now, what they did was they, they got uh, Indian astrology, Persian astrology, and also then the Hellenistic, the Greek astrology, in about eight or nine hundred, the uh, these Arab, mostly they were they would be Jewish or Christian, but they're writing in in, in Arabic. They created a new synthesis, and uh, you know, Hori astrology was something that you know that they really developed. It's very complex, very precise, an incredible detail. And when it came to Europe, in fact, the Western traditional astrology is Arabic astrology. If you look at, for example, William Lilly in the back of Christian Astrology, which is a very famous Hori text, he has a list of all the sources. And 80% of them are, are, you know, are Arabic sources written in Arabic. And so our traditional astrology really is Arabic astrology. Now it's simplified. You know, that's something that people have been translating. There's a guy named Ben Dykes. He's a, um, a, a, a you know, a PhD uh, in philosophy, and uh, he's been translating all these Arabic texts. So well, finally, I mean, if you couldn't read Arabic, you couldn't read Latin, you wouldn't have been able to have access to it, but all of a sudden now you can start reading this material and using it. So we're still kind of in the infancy of reviving a lot of this traditional astrology. And um, so, um, you know, again, like I said, it's a very exciting time to be, to be practicing and to be learning about these and have all this stuff available to you. You just go to the, you know, go online and you can order it. You know, it's, it's really great. 
Yeah, it's amazing because the techniques from those days are really, really powerful. You do a thriving business, for example, in electional astrology where people who are wanting to know when the right time would be to start a business or when should I put my home on the market to sell it and things like that. I'll, I'll, the techniques that you use, these are, these, these, these are ancient, time-proven uh, techniques. And much like as a lawyer, you would consult you know, a, a, an accumulated body of uh, legal opinion. Uh, and for, for to establish a precedent for something, but with astrology, that that corpus of knowledge is much much bigger, isn't it? I think that's a really good analogy because you know people say, well, you're an astrologer, an attorney. That's so different. I'm like, you know, really not. I'm using my expert knowledge to help you know, my clients. And you know what I like about both of them is just like you said. I mean, there's a tra- there's a great tradition, and there's a lot of theory. At the same time, you have a practical situation in front of you. If you're a lawyer and you have a case, you've got to be able to deal with the judge, and you've got to explain it to him, and you've got to be able to deal with it. At the same time, if you don't know the law, you know, you've got nothing to work with. The same thing with astrology. I mean, I've got these books, and I follow the, you know, follow the tradition. At the same time, I've got someone in front of me saying, look, you know, like today someone's asking about a visa. You know, will my relative get a visa? You know, and so I've got to sit down and apply the knowledge and the experience. Because it's practical. What we're doing is modeling reality, and we're trying to come up with a, a model of reality that's accurate. Now, what's interesting about it, too, is that judgment comes into play. I mean, you know, you have a situation where with a traditional astrology, I can sit down and sort of mechanically crank through all the different factors in the chart and get about 75% of the information I need. The rest, though, I have to use my intuition and my judgment. Now, I only do within the chart, though. For example, if, if, if you're asking about, will I marry this person and their significator is afflicted, then I would say, well, that person's unable, unwilling, or unsuitable for the relationship. Now, which of those it is, I'm going to have to look at the rest of the chart you know, or use my intuition about what's going on. But it only will be, you know, I'm not sitting down and tuning into the situation like a psychic, you know. And right. at the same time, I, you know, you, intuition comes into it. But you can train in it. It's amazing. The more you do of this, the more prediction you do, the better you are at it. You know, and I like for myself to do I Ching, and I get better and better and better at doing it. Though I only I don't do that professionally; just do it for myself. But the practice at it, the practice of prediction is great, and people can do this themselves. The first thing you got to do, though, stop doubting it. Stop that. Doubt, you don't have to believe in it automatically, but you got to stop disbelieving in it. And you got to right. because in our lives, you know, for example, today it was interesting. I was listening to this music, this song from like you know when I was like like in high school. You know, um, and I just listened to it on on the on the on YouTube. I don't know why I was listening to it. I just kind of popped up. And then today, like twelve hours later, I'm walking past this store. It's really relatively obscure now, and I'm hearing that same song. You know, and so we tend to think, oh, it's a coincidence. There are no coincidences in the spiritual view of reality. Everything's connected. So that's the first thing you can do is quit doubting that you know these, that these things have meaning, and then you start uh-huh. just paying attention to it. Thing. And I don't even necessarily know what that means as far as that same song, but, you know, you pay attention to those patterns, you pay attention and you're open to it. And you can find, you can do it yourself. I mean, my students, the more they practice at it and once they learn the technique, the better and better they get at it. So that, that's fun, too. I really do enjoy teaching um, because it, there's always a sort of aha moment for people. They'll kind of have trouble putting right. it together, then all of a sudden, you know, lesson six or seven or something, they're like, oh, yeah, they get it. You know, and then they're able right. to actually do this prediction themselves. That's really kind of exciting. Well, Mr. Warnock, I can't believe our hour just flew by. We've reached the wow, end of our interview. I really want to thank you for sharing your time and knowledge with us here tonight. I'd like to remind everyone that you can find Chris Warnock at Renaissance Astrology, uh, really, RenaissanceAstrology.com, uh, an excellent source of learning and enrichment. Uh, Chris, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. My pleasure. We'll we'll have you on again sometime, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. All right, you too. All right. Hello, my name is Res Miranda. If you're having relationship, career, or life issues, I'm inviting you to experience what it's like to have access to professional, highly accurate psychics and spiritual advisors you can trust to care and help you. Register now to get your free six-minute reading by telephone or chat. Get answers. Get access. Psychic access. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. PsychicAccess.com
much different science than we did and and you're a modern intellectual how did you deal with the fact that they for instance thought that the sun revolved around the earth and 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 things that we now know are false well i'm not a modern intellectual anymore <laughs> okay I'm traditional i mean here's the thing okay you know one of the things one of the things i really emphasize with my students and in fact i we start all my full courses out if you want to study with me you know, as a full student, the first thing we start out with is something called worldview. And worldview is, it's not just our philosophy about the world, it's our unconscious assumptions, it's our whole conditioning and, and our, what we've been brought up to believe and, and, and how we've been taught to see the world. And so there's a tendency to say, well, it, reality is reality. But we all have a very specific view of reality that's very much coming from our culture and what we've been trained to see. And so the modern worldview is based ultimately on a view that nothing exists except matter and energy. And usually when people say spirituality, what they mean is a fancy kind of psychology. And what psychology is, is from your mind, and what's your mind? It's your brain thinking. It, it must be, because obviously right. nothing exists except matter and energy. And if people think about spiritual things as some kind of energy, it's like magnetism or something, and that's, it sort of gets in a loop with that. Traditional, now before what they call, call, I always say the quote enlightenment, before about 1700, and in fact in every traditional society in the world, so our society is alone really in thinking that, they saw the spiritual as something that really existed. Now, not physically, it doesn't physically exist, but, right. you know, and let me just give you an example, a way to kind of wrap your head around it. Okay. Essentially, we've got, you know, there's no other physical place other than where we are right now. You know, the, the universe, that's all there is physically. But if we think about that, there's more to it than just matter and energy. And, I, and, and the example I'm going to give you is if you think about a savanna, you know, like it's say in Africa, before right. there's even any life on it, you've got a certain amount of water, a certain amount of light, a certain amount of nutrients. That can support, let's say, a million pounds of vegetation. Okay? And we know that because we know how much light there is, we know how much water there is, how much sunlight there is. And that's the carrying capacity of that land. And then with that million pounds of vegetation, that can support 100,000 pounds of herbivore. And so you can, you can have antelopes or whatever. Before there's even anything there, we know there's only going to be that many, you know, that many uh, you know, herbivores. Then you've got 1,000 pounds of carnivore. So all these complex ecological niches, all these complex interactions are built in there before there's even anything happening. And that's a good way to think about the spiritual because it's the underlying relationships that are built in to, to, the, to the cosmos. And so, you know, that, getting your kind of head around that, it takes a long time. It took me about 10 years to kind of step out of the modern way of thinking and step into the traditional way of thinking. And so by worldviews, you can almost put on or put off like a hat, you know. Mm -hmm. And so you put that traditional worldview on where magic is possible, where the spiritual exists, and all of a sudden, you can do magic, and you can work with the spiritual realm. And so, if you think like a modern person, right, you're going to have trouble. Mm -hmm. Now, the sun going around the earth. Okay, that's an interesting one. So, you know, that's true if you go out into space. That's exactly what you're going to observe. From the, from the standpoint of earth, though, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. And I mean, if you, if you try to r run your life in such a way that the sun doesn't rise in the east and set in the west, that's kind of a messed up life. You're not, you're going to be getting up in the middle of the night, you know, <laughs> right. that's reality from this particular standpoint. Okay. And if you think about celestial navigation, like if you were out in a ship before we had, you know, um, uh, you know, a famous horror astrologer, we have some lists of, we have his workbooks and there's page after page of love questions. And that's exactly what I get. So, you know, typically what, you know, again, today, um, you know, I had people asking me about, about love, and they say, you know, very typically, they've got someone they're interested in, what's going to happen with this relationship? And so what I do is, uh, traditional astrology is very focused on practical, um, you know, uh, concrete results. So what I, the technique I love is called horary astrology, where you look at the time of the asking of the chart, or actually when I receive and understand it, but it's the time of the chart rather than a birth chart, and then that gives us the answer. So if someone comes to me and says, you know, Chris, uh, you know, I've got, I've just met this wonderful person. Will I marry them or will I have a, a, a committed relationship with them? 
I take it, I look at the heavens at that moment, and then I can judge the results from that. And so that's that's real useful. That's real useful information. You can I can I can predict the future not for everything in all respects, but if you can ask a yes or no question, right, that has concrete results, then I can give the answer to that question pretty accurately. So I think that's pretty useful. And so um, you know, I really think you know we 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 tend to think oh we've got TVs and we've got you know we've got internet and everything, but in fact this is a methodology that's been proven you know, over uh, basically about a thousand years of, of practice. And so that's one of the reasons that it's so accurate and so precise. So that's a bit of a bit of, I'm going to give you a lot of long answers. Give me a short <laughs> question. Well, that's fine. That's, that's what you're that here for. I'm cer certainly hoping to hear them. And I got to say, uh, you, I've, Hor uh, Warnock's Horary Casebook is a, a foundational text for for my efforts to understand horary, uh, you can definitely find that at renaissanceastrology.com along with a variety of Mr. Warnock's other writings. Uh, now, I'd actually, one question I, I'm curious, the, the, the traditional astrologers, they had a, Christopher Warnock is a, in my opinion, a luminary in the world of astrology, magic, and hermetic mysticism. Uh, this this towering intellect is not only a man whose books that I've read in order to advance my knowledge of astrology. Uh, he's also trying to get Chris on the line right now, actually. Um, now, as I was saying, Christopher Warnock has actually filed no fewer than 16 petitions of A. Kertiorari with the United States Supreme Court. And he's a member in good standing with the bar of the Supreme Court of Iowa. So his credentials are impeccable. And uh, I tell you what, I'm very thrilled to have him here with us tonight. And as soon as he gets here, we are actually going to talk all about mysticism and spirituality in the Renaissance era and how it applies to the modern day. And I do believe Mr. Warnock is with us uh, now. Mr. Warnock, are you there? Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Oh, how nice. How nice. Well, thank you very much for joining us. We have so much to get into tonight, and I don't want to waste a single second. Well, I have a lot of people, they ask me, you know, what can traditional astrology do for me? You know, my problems are modern and complex. Uh, what would you say to somebody who asks you that question? Oh, we had, they had the same problems then as they do now. Everyone <laughs> wants to know about love. That's the biggest question I get, right? right. And then they yeah. ask about money. And then they have a variety of other, of other questions. But, you know, people just don't really change. You know, we've got the same problems then as now. And sure. so, um, you know, someone might be asking about, actually, I'm not very good at lost items. I was going to say, well, they lost their car keys. But um, I, don't do, I don't like to do lost item worries. I'm not very good at those. But love questions, hey, I get a lot of those questions. And just like Lily, William Lily, who was a very tracking and everything like that, before we have all the satellites, um, then you would have used uh, a ge what's called geocentric astronomy, which, again, the Earth is stands still for that, and the sun rises and east sets in the west, and everything revolves around it. It's perfectly accurate, again, for surveying. And so it's a matter of perspective, you know. And the Earth going around the sun, actually, sometimes, you know, people, people there were those theories are out there. The other one that I, I hear a lot is, oh, they just thought the world was flat. Nobody from about 400 B.C. was educated <laughs> to the present ever thought the world was flat. That's a myth that's been invented. We like to think we're really advanced. And we right. do have some technology. But certainly in a spiritual way, we're way, way far behind, you know, our, our ancestors. They had they were far more advanced than we were spiritually in their knowledge. And so the thing is it, it is is that, you know, the type of astronomy that I use and, you know, if you go to astronomers, they'll, they'll, they grind their teeth, but they'll admit, yes, it's perfectly accurate in terms of if you look up in the sky, that's what you'd see. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're working at. We're, it's, it's just, you know, the, the heliocentric, the, you know, the, the sun moving around the Earth. I mean, again, even NASA, when they sent a sat, you know, when they send satellites to Mars or whatever, they're using geocentric astronomy because it works for that, for that methodology. And none of these is absolute truth. Again, it depends on what your perspective, what you're going for. And so since we're looking at cycles and the heavens give us a very regular cycle, it works. Now, you could do a, a heliocentric astronomy. I mean, there are people that do that. It's relatively new. The nice thing about the astrology, that, astronomy that we use is it's, like I said, a thousand years old. We've had a lot of time to work with it. 
And so I guess the final thing I'd say about that is if it's like saying, look, I went to the movies and I saw this newsreel and someone says, oh, no, that's all fake. Because, you know, in fact, when you see a movie, it's just still pictures. So that was all an illusion. You know, it doesn't really, it's not really the truth. And you say, well, that's true, but that doesn't mean that the news that I saw on that isn't correct. You're, you're correct that, yeah, that's how it works. But that's what I saw. It looks like.